AP Biology, Chapter 41, Animal Nutrition, Part 5. Where we left off was with the liver, and the, the liver is one of your digestive organs, as well as the pancreas. Remember that the liver produces something called bile, and here I drew a picture. Bile acts as like a detergent. Uh, basically, it surrounds the fat droplets and makes it uh, easier for lipases, enzymes, to break down the fat into smaller molecules. So here we have the fat. Maybe you ate some uh, fried chicken or something like that. Your liver makes bile, and your gallbladder stores it until it's needed. So once you eat a fatty meal, the gallbladder secretes bile from the gallbladder and or the liver right into the small intestine. And then the bile surrounds the fat droplets, which increases surface area for lipases to uh, break it down. And the bile salts are a little bit bigger than they actually would be in this picture. By the way, that's how detergents work when you wash your hands. Uh, you surround the oily parts on your hands with uh, detergent, and then it just kind of slides right off into the sink. So it kind of uh, works in the same way. Now this bile uh, is actually a byproduct of red blood cells that are broken down uh, in your liver. And the uh, bile is, uh, makes its way into your feces eventually. And there's iron in the red blood cells as well. That iron in the hemoglobin within the red blood cells is what makes brown feces brown. Here's a new word also, emulsify, and you didn't even know what this is. Emulsify uh, means to surround something. So the bile surrounds or emulsifies the fats and then increases surface area for lipases to work more efficiently. Let's go ahead and write that in. You can sketch this if you'd like, but you don't have to. This is basically what it does in your body. All right, what are the two functions of the liver? The digestive function is to produce bile. And then the gallbladder stores the bile. Now, you might be asking yourself, what if you have your gallbladder removed? Let's say you have some uh, gallstones in there and they can't uh, get rid of them, so they have to remove your gallbladder. Well, you still make bile, you still have a liver. However, you can't store the bile. So think to yourself, what are you probably going to have to cut out of your diet if you um, only make a little bit of bile when you eat a meal? The answer is fatty foods. If you eat a, fatty f a large fatty food meal, the gallbladder would secrete extra bile to help you break that down or to emulsify it. But if you don't have the gallbladder anymore, then you have to eat less fatty foods because you're not storing any extra bile. Bile also sometimes tastes really nasty if it comes back up into your throat for some reason. And um, people use that to uh, refer to something that leaves a bad taste in the mouth. All right, so the digestive function, once again, is bile. And the energy storage um, function is as glycogen. Remember, it can store glucose in chains called glycogen, also known as animal starch. The third function is detoxification that we'll talk about in a future chapter. Basically, it's going to uh, convert ammonia into urea. So we're still in the small intestine. We're secreting some things from the pancreas as far as digestive enzymes. And remember, also bicarbonate to neutralize acid in the uh, intestines is secreted by the pancreas as well. The liver is secreting bile, also the gallbladder, uh, to emulsify fats. And now the small intestine. Let's talk a little bit more about this. There's these little finger-like protrusions in the small intestine called villi, and you need to, you need to know what they do. Increase surface area so we can absorb more stuff from our food that we eat. We want to get every last bit of nutrient out of that food, every last, last bit of energy. On top of these little villi, which increase surface area, we have even smaller, tiny little um, villi, if you want to call them that, on top of the main villi. And these little villi are called microvilli, also called a brush border. So you have the villi, and then you also have the microvilli. Now, there's um, something you should know about these villi and microvilli. When you break down your starch into sugars, the sugars can be absorbed by active transport, not by diffusion, right into the bloodstream. So why active transport? Why wouldn't you want to use diffusion? The answer is to get every last bit of sugar out of the food you, that you ate. All the stuff that you eat, really, you want to reclaim in your body. And if you rely on just diffusion, when you have no more diffusion occurring because there is a, uh, equilibrium or no difference in concentration on both sides of the uh, intestine brush border, then you wouldn't be able to move any more materials into your bloodstream. However, if you use active transport to pump the glucose and amino acids and other things into your bloodstream, then you can get a lot more out of your food, even though you're going to use a little energy in the process of doing that. 
So you should know that active transport pumps most things like glucose into your bloodstream from your small intestine. Now the one exception is fats. Fats don't go, right, go directly from your intestines into your bloodstream, like most things like sugars, nucleic acids broken down into nucleotides, and amino acids broken down from proteins. The fats will enter your lymphatic system. The lymphatic system is a secondary set of tubes that returns fluid back to your uh, circulatory system. Fats will enter the lymphatic system, located in yellow here, first, and then in a long uh, pathway be taken to the circulatory system. So to review, we have villi, increased surface area, microvilli, further increased surface area, actual place of exchange between the small intestines and lumen, which is just a space inside, and your circulatory system. That's where it eventually has to go. The circulatory system takes up things like glucose, nucleotides, and nucleosides, as well as amino acids by active transport. They're going to pump that stuff from your intestines into your bloodstream to get every last bit out of your food. The fat eat will be surrounded first by bile salts produced by the liver and then broken down further by lipases secreted by the pancreas. Then the fats will enter the lymphatic system first and then be taken to the circulatory system. The structure is lots of surfaces for each one of the little villi, which relates to its function of absorbing as much material as possible from the foods you eat. All right, so absorption of nutrients. Again, most of them are active transport. That's what I need you to know. You don't have to memorize that fructose is passive transport, uh, but you should know that most of the things that you eat are going to be actively transported right into your, um, from the cells of the brush border into your bloodstream. Let's go ahead and write this down if you uh, think you might forget it. All right, last part of the digestive system is the large intestine. It's not large as far as the length. Your small intestine is much longer. It's large in the, in the, um, the diameter of the uh, large intestine. So we're talking large uh, as a cross-section, not as far as the total length. It's actually much shorter than the small intestine. Now, the large intestine is going to mainly just reclaim water, and that's the main uh, job of the large intestine, also known as the colon. If you ever heard of a colonoscopy, well, that affects your colon, and they basically go up with a camera and check this entire large intestine for any polyps or precancerous tumors that could give you colon cancer, and that's where colon cancer would occur in this last part. Now remember, you're doing a lot of hydrolysis, which requires a lot of water when you do digestion. Remember, hydrolytic means that you require water to break something apart. And so you secrete a lot of water when you're digesting your food. But you don't want to lose water. You're an animal that requires a lot of water. So your large intestine reabsorbs much of that water back into your, um, into your body. If your inner lining of your large intestine is irritated by bacterial infections or some kind of amoeba, then it won't take the water up. The farther apart. So if your large intestine is irritated and doesn't reabsorb water, the water with the feces just kind of mixes together, and bam, you got diarrhea, and that's how that works. Constipation is when you reabsorb too much water. Now, the main thing you do when you have diarrhea is just drink more water, and you could actually die from diarrhea. You could be so dehydrated that you can't even carry on your life uh, functions with that uh, medium to transport stuff. So that could be a serious condition. And of course, you just drink more water if that's the problem. Reclaims water. So what's living in your large intestine? The most common organism living in your large intestine is E. coli, Estridia coli. Now it's strain 157 that causes disease, and hopefully you don't have that strain living in your large intestine. As a byproduct of their metabolism, uh, they produce a lot of gases, including methane and hydrogen sulfide. And basically those are your fart gases. So if you have a fart, well, that's not really your fault. It's the E. coli breaking down the food that you can't break down. And you don't, a lot of people don't have the enzyme to break down proteins and beans. 
So when you eat those beans, your enzymes don't break it down. The proteins make it to the E. coli. The E. coli can break it down. And as a byproduct, they give off methane gas and hydrogen sulfide. Maybe you've seen some of those movies where they light their farts on fire. You can actually light methane and uh, hydrogen sulfide on fire. So uh, it would actually work. However, I would not recommend it. Also, the E. coli that live in the large intestine produce some vitamins for us. This is mutualism, where we benefit because we get these vitamins. And they also colonize the area, prevent bad bacteria from getting a foothold. So just by them living in our large intestine, they prevent other things from growing in there. And, of course, they benefit because they get the food that we can't break down. So there's a second chance at that food. at this point. They produce vitamins and they colonize the intestine, prevent other things from colonizing that might be more harmful to us. They get a free meal and that type of symbiosis is called mutualism. Remember the other types of uh, symbiosis are parasitism, commensalism, competition, predation. All right, rectum is the last end or terminal end of the colon. This is where the the feces come out, obviously. Uh, by the way, how does that feces come out? Well, that is the result of peristalsis. Remember, peristalsis, once again, is the contraction, contraction, rhythmic contraction, of the smooth muscle. And that's going to happen from esophagus all the way down to the rectum. So you know what peristalsis feels like if you've done a number two. And inside the feces are masses of bacteria. Those bacteria in your large intestine, they're constantly being replaced and eliminated. Also, any undigested materials like cellulose, roughage, fiber. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do they ask you to get fiber in your diet if you can't break it down? Well, that roughage kind of gives the smooth muscle along the um, large intestine and small intestine something to push against to help uh, make sure that things move, move through your digestive system smoothly. So even though you don't need digest, uh, cellulose or fiber in your diet to live, it does help digestion because it allows the smooth muscle to push against it. And if you don't get enough uh, fiber in your diet, you're going to go through a lot of toilet paper because things don't hold uh, together very well. As an experiment, if you wanted to find out how long it takes for things to go through your digestive system, since you can't break down cellulose, what you can do is eat corn on the cob. Now, the inside part of the corn is endosperm, that starch you can break down for energy. However, the outside part, the husk or the kernel, is uh, the outside kernel, is actually made of uh, cellulose and it doesn't break down. So you can use it as a tracer if you wanted to. Next time you eat corn on the cob, notice how long it takes for the corn to appear in the, um, in the restroom. And since the, you know, the cellulose of the corn uh, doesn't break down, that's a good way to find out how long it takes for things to go from point A to point B. You don't have to do that experiment, that is optional. Scat and stools are other names for feces. Remember, lots of nitrogen in those for plants. All right, structural adaptations. Last thing we have to take some notes on and to learn about. Dentition is basically teeth, uh, length of digestive system, and size and uh, number of stomachs. We're going to talk about each in turn. Dentition or teeth, uh, these are pretty easy to understand. So here we have carnivores. What kind of uh, teeth is better adapted for slicing meat if you're a carnivore? Well, the slicers, things like the canines and incisors. And that's what you tend to see more of on a carnivore. An herbivore is going to be grinding plant matter, and they have the structural teeth uh, adaptations to uh, account for this. Most of their teeth are grinders, like in a horse. Horses have this little area where they don't have teeth. So flat teeth, herbivores grinding plant matter, slicing teeth, like these canines, carnivores, slicing the flesh from prey. If you're an omnivore, you have both types of teeth. You have adaptations for grinding plant matter, like we do in the back with our molars, and slicing meat, like we do with our incisors and uh, canines in front. And that's all you have to know about dentition. By the way, when we look at dinosaur fossils, that's what we look for, is the teeth. If they have all grinding teeth, they were probably some kind of herbivore like Triceratops. They have a bunch of sharp teeth, like the T-Rex, they were probably a carnivore. So just by looking at the teeth, you can tell something about the diet of the animal. 
Uh, another thing that you have to know, the length of digestive systems. Now, herbivores and omnivores have longer digestive systems as an adaptation for digesting harder to break down cellulose. So if you take a look over here, we got the koala bear, and this guy has the one of the longest cecums, this is a cecum here, in the animal world. Basically, we have a large or long small intestine and large intestine for more breaking down of plant matter. The cecum, by the way, in a lot of herbivores holds beneficial or benign bacteria that will help break down that cellulose. Remember, animals can't break down cellulose. They don't have something to break down the beta linkages, an enzyme to break down, down the beta linkages. But there are microorganisms like bacteria that can do that. So basically, the koala bear stores extra microorganisms, bacteria, to help them break, them break down that cellulose. In carnivores, they have a shorter um, digestive system, and meat is easier to break down than cellulose. So the meat um, doesn't uh, select for a longer digestive system because it, there is no real survival advantage to having a larger digestive system if you're a meat eater. All right, it's pretty easy. Herbivores, omnivores, longer. Carnivores, shorter. Why longer for the herbivores? Because plant matter takes longer to break down and it provides them a survival advantage. Dentition means teeth. Remember, cellulose, chain of sugars. However, they're held together by the beta linkage, which is not easy to break down. Starch, held together by alpha linkages, easier to break down. All, pretty much every animal can break down starch with enzymes. You can read this if you want. This is just some background information. All right, so cows can digest cellulose well. They have a lot of, uh, they have extra, extra stomachs, actually, we're going to talk about now. Gorillas can't digest cellulose well. They supplement with uh, fruit, so they tend to like fruit more than uh, uh, things like cows because they don't have quite as complicated a digestive system as cows for breaking down cellulose. And this is what we're going to end with, symbiotic organisms. So these uh, cows and deer and other animals like them, they're called ruminants. Ruminants, R-U-M-I-N-A-N-T. And what ruminants, ruminants have is extra stomachs, called a rumen. Now this rumen stores symbiotic gut bacteria to help them break down that cellulose. So let's uh, kind of trace this through. The cow eats the grass. Grass ends up in the rumen, where it mixes with beneficial bacteria that can break it down. And then they regurgitate it. And then when they regurgitate it, it ends up back in their mouth. And then they chew the food some more. At this point, it's called cud. Maybe you've heard of a cow chewing its cud. When it's chewing the plant matter, it's actually breaking open the fibers of the plant to expose more surface area, you've heard that before, and allows the bacteria that were in the rumen to get at those places where they couldn't get at before. Remember, bacteria are very small. They can't get at some places in that uh, grass that was eaten by the cow. But if the cow rechews the food, then you increase the surface area, expose more areas in that food where the bacteria can get to, so they can break the cellulose into sugars more completely. Then the cud with the bacteria and broken down uh, sugars within the, that cud enters some other stomachs that you don't have to know about, and eventually the intestines where they absorb the sugar. So the big thing you have to know here is rumen. In some animals like cows and deer that store extra bacteria that allows them to break down their food more effectively. Let's write that down. Rumen ruminates, cow, deer, extra stomach. All right, this ends your chapter 41 notes.